Is that a... okay? Okay, good, good. Well, thank you all for joining. Um, we're going to give everyone a few more minutes to log in and then we will get started.
Hi, all. We'll be getting started in uh, the next couple of minutes, just um, troubleshooting some technical issues.
Great, thank you all again for joining and apologies for the delay. Um, thank you for joining the third session of Gradient's Critical Care Webinar Series, where we'll be focusing today on the recognition of a critically ill patient. Um, just before we get started, I'm going to share a couple of housekeeping rules and um, uh, comments that, that'll help you participate and engage with the presenters during the session. Um, so if you have any questions or any comments during the session, please use the Q&A function that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, you should also be able to chat with um, the hosts and the panelists as well if you have any issues during the presentation. Um, you may have seen already that the uh, webinar will be recorded. Um, we will have the webinar up um, within the next couple of days after the webinar on our website, radianthealth.org. Um, as well as on our YouTube channel, we will be sharing an email um, for all those who participated today with the link to the webinar recording. Um, and as always, and, and we will follow up at the end of this, but if you have any feedback that you'd like to share, have any questions or any suggestions for the next webinars, um, please reach out to us directly at customers at gradienthealth.org. Um, we all um, love to hear from you and love to hear your feedback and comments and questions and even and even critiques. So feel free to, to reach out to us directly. I will now turn it over to the team um, to get us started um, to, to review some of the session objectives. Good afternoon, um, good morning, good evening, everyone. Um, I hope you can, you can all hear me loud and clear. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Ndava Sipuka. Um, I'm a physician anesthetist uh, based in Lusaka, Zambia, and I'll be co-moderating uh, today's session. So today, once again, we, we have chosen a very, very important topic, a topic that um, affects uh, all of us, irrespective of uh, uh, the country, irrespective of the facility you, you work from. We all uh, take care of very sick patients, or we've seen a patient who is very deteriorating. So today's uh, session objectives, uh, at the end of this session, we should be able to define a critically ill patient. Um, we should also be able to discuss the importance of early recognition of a critical, critically ill patient, as well as some of the methods that we can use to recognize a, a patient that's deteriorating or a patient that's developing critical illness. We will also discuss um, monitoring as well as the importance of patient, patient monitoring in critical care. We will also discuss the early warning scoring systems, one of the tools that we use to recognize um, early signs of patient deterioration in different uh, clinical settings. And we'll also briefly discuss some of the disease-specific scoring systems that are used in the care of critically ill patients. We'll also outline a comprehensive or systematic assessment of a critically ill patient. And then last but not the least, um, we'll go through some of the recommendations uh, for improving clinical capacity for early recognition of critical, critical illness. So our discussion today, again, is centered on early recognition of, um, of a critically ill patient and some of the a few interventions that you can do or some of the few <clears throat> ways you can use to recognize critical illness. So at this point, I'm going to hand over to the, next, to the first uh, presenter, um, who will take us through the first part uh, of, the, of the presentation. And then he will also subsequently hand over to the last presenter who will finish off the last part of the presentation. So I'll hand over to a colleague uh, from Nepal. His name is Dr. Pusparaj uh, Powder. Uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's an experienced 
uh, anesthesiologist, intensivist, with a good number of years of experience and work in Nepal. Let me introduce you to Dr. Napao. Dr. Napao, are you there? Yes, Dr. Yandaba. Oh, okay, Dr. Paudo. Please, you can you can take it up. Thank you, Dr. Yandaba. And uh, hello, everyone. Well, a warm good evening from Nepal. And I'm taking the first session of this webinar, and it will be focused on the recognition of the critically ill patients. So in our last webinar that we discussed about the critical care and the critical illness and how to set up a critical care uh, set up in a resource limited area and all those things. So after setting up, uh, so the next thing that comes in our mind before managing the patient in the critical setup is that how we are going to recognize this patient is critically ill. This patient needs uh, intensive care and this patient should be immediately shifted to the uh, ICU. So uh, the recognition of the critically ill patient is very important. And uh, this critical illness that uh, carries uh, a significant burden uh, in the hospital that uh, it, it will cause for the uh, mor morbidity and mortality also. So uh, our aim is to decrease the, the, the more risks of morbidity and the decrease the time risks of mortality also. So early recognition by the organ recognition, what we can do is that, that first thing, uh, by recognizing the critically ill patient in the ward level, we can decrease the uh, admission of the ICUs up to 40%. That means that uh, most of our patients are not uh, well managed in the outside the critical care so that they can land up uh, in the ICUs and the ICUs are over flooded and uh, we, we some, sometimes we miss patients outside the ICUs uh, and because of uh, the failure to recognize the situation. And these critically ill patients are uh, very time sensitive. So uh, there is a golden period, some minutes, some hours are there uh, within which we can, if we can inter uh, intervene with simple oxygenation, with simple fluid dialysis, or simple transfusion or other uh, very simple measures that we can do outside the critical, uh, critical care area, we can save the lives of the patient and we can decrease the morbidity and mortality. So recognition of the critically ill patient or the patient who are uh, acutely deteriorating is very crucial. Uh, not only for uh, determining the treatment, but also to reduce the morbidity and mortality. So in those deteriorating patients, there are some sort of danger signs that will indicate that, oh, okay, this patient is going to uh, deteriorate or some uh, organ dysfunction is there. Uh, so if we identify that patient early in the phase of organ dysfunction and we intervene, we can prevent the further organ damage, and uh, subsequently you can prevent the uh, death of, of those patients. So every hospital should have some uh, system to recognize this sort of critical illness, and uh, some, there must be some system which can uh, respond to those uh, critically ill patients, stabilize them, and do the needful according to their condition so that uh, we can avoid the adverse outcome. So there are various methods and tools that, that uh, are uh, exist and that has been practiced around the world for the recognition of critical ill patients and uh, to prevent them and to resuscitate them early in the stage. Uh, so we'll be discussing some of those methods and tools, uh, some scoring systems and some assessment uh, uh, technique for the critical ill in uh, this webinar. So uh, now talking about the who are the critically ill patients then? The uh, critically ill patients or critical illness, it's a, any disease process which can cause physiological instability that can lead to disability, death, um, and that can happen within the minutes or hours. So that critical illness uh, is often associated with uh, dysfunction of the vital organ like 
the cardiovascular system, failure of cardiovascular system, failure of respiratory system, or decreased level of consciousness like uh, central nervous system or renal or other metabolic uh, component. Like most of the critically ill patient have one or two uh, of these organ system, which is dysfunction or getting uh, into the phase of the uh, organ damage. So we have to know uh, these are the, who are the critically ill patients and we have to identify early. And uh, for the definition, there have been lots of definitions of the critical illness and a study by Robertson et al. They have uh, defined the critical ill patient like uh, those who has a life-threatening multi-system process that can result in significant morbidity and mortality. And in most of the cases, there is a, a period of physiological deterioration. These sort of critically ill patient doesn't uh, acutely goes into arrest or death or deterioration. And uh, there is some time between the deterioration and that golden period of deterioration where there are early signs of deterioration that we should pick. And evidence suggests that the early signs are frequently missed because uh, of lack of uh, monitoring, because of lack of trained manpower, because of uh, a lack of timely uh, communication or because of lack of timely resuscitation or something like that. So early signs we are uh, even in the well uh, uh, established setup that uh, we are frequently missing the uh, those signs of uh, uh, early detection of those critical ill patients. And uh, by definition, the critical care is just uh, taking care of the critically ill patient who are already gone into uh, physiological deterioration and having multi-system disorder or dysfunction. It's not like that. Patients uh, who are getting into the dysfunction or high risk patients are also to be taken care in the critical cares, it also comes under the area of the critical care. So uh, the critical care, uh, it should not be confined into the uh, boundary of uh, ICU or critical care area only. It's uh, the critical care team should be looking after all over the uh, hospital so that uh, they can identify those sort of patients and provide uh, early a, a, a resuscitative measures so, so that patient cannot land up in the crash, land up in the ICUs or some morbidity and mortality can happen. So uh, recognizing early is very important uh, to have a good outcome on, uh, so that uh, rapid identification will lead to rapid uh, diagnosis. And with that uh, uh, diagnosis, usually in the uh, critically ill patient, the de definite diagnosis can may be delayed because we need other investigation or some uh, some other uh, evidences to go into for the final diagnosis but we have a physiological diagnosis okay what are, is the physiological uh, derangement is going on and we can institute the definitive treatment then and there and the critical care team uh, if assesses early then that maximizes the benefit that there is a, uh, established uh, uh, evidence that the care from the critical care team has uh, shown the improved chances of the better outcomes. And the care provider should have some skills to recognize the critically ill patients and have uh, uh, can do some intervention uh, very early in, in the phase. So they must uh, have. Uh, should have the skill for the recognition and if needed the escalation of the uh, care that means escalation means escalation in the monitoring that uh, if you are monitoring the, that those patients uh, on six hourly basis then you should uh, now if you think that patient is deteriorating then you can escalate the care uh, and you, you can uh, increase the frequency of the uh, monitoring and also escalation of care. And that means you can communicate with your uh, seniors or the specialist. And uh, there must be some uh, 
sort of uh, specialized care uh, patient may need like uh, some specialized uh, nephrology, cardiology or pulmonary care that can uh, be sought for and patient should be prioritized for the care uh, and they should be triaged and uh, the most important part is the resource allocation. So uh, resource in terms of the human resource, in terms of, of the uh, uh, equipments, all those things. And other important thing is the early activation of the rapid response team. So in hospital, there must be a rapid response team and there must be some mechanism to activate that system. So uh, that a rapid response team can uh, act uh, come early, respond, and they can uh, treat better uh, for those uh, patients. So the recognition and early management of clinical illness, there are lots of literature. Some of the links have already been uh, shared in the chat box also. You can go through those literature also. Uh, so there are various methods that can be used to recognize the critical illness. So what is the common pathway is that initially we are doing uh, assessment, uh, we are monitoring the patient, some vital signs we are monitoring, we are getting information from that and uh, there must be some early warning scores we will discuss later on and uh, some disease specific scoring systems are also there which can help uh, further help to uh, predict the patient uh, prognosis and uh, the uh, morbid and they can predict the mor mor morbidity and mortality and uh, the reporting system we will uh, go one by one in these topics so assessment of the critically ill patient is very difficult because uh, in patients are uh, suddenly deteriorating and you are called upon in the ward or in the emergency room or uh, even in the operating theater okay some patient has crashed and uh, you are sought for for assessment and the uh, management of that patient so uh, the assessment of these critically ill patient is uh, very different uh, that are uh, 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 compared to the other routine assessment that in those sort of patients, other patients, we take history, we do uh, detailed physical exams and we look for the investigation, we wait for that and we come to the uh, some uh, diagnosis and then only the treatment starts. But for the critically ill patients, the uh, uh, assessment and the intervention, it should go parallelly. So the um, it should be drawn by the trained personnel and uh, it should be a structured one so that uh, every, uh, there must be standardized and uniformity in the assessment and the management of the patient. So uh, assessment of the critically ill patient is usually done in the uh, ABCDE approach and that we will discuss in detail in the next uh, uh, subsequent session uh, by Dr. Paul. And uh, this assessment, uh, structured assessment, uh, facilitate identification and correction of the life-threatening problems by, by the priority, by triaging and giving the priority to the vital uh, organ systems and uh, intervene simultaneously. If the airway, there is a problem, we'll uh, manage that airway, we'll support the breathing, then we we'll move on to the circulation and so on. So it provides the standardized actors so that there is uniformity between the, all the professionals. So coming to the routine monitoring of the vital signs, that uh, monitoring is very important that uh, monitoring of the patient, if you continuously monitoring a monitor of patient, then you can uh, know that whether this patient is deteriorating or not. Uh, so vital signs that we uh, regularly monitor are very simple parameters, very easy to perform, very easy to interpret, and that can be interpreted or uh, performed by the uh, working staffs and um, uh, all those things. So, but these vital signs are very crucial and uh, this can give a good um, idea of the deteriorating patient. So early indication we can have. And uh, so there must be, all, our staff should be trained uh, on the recording of this vital monitoring signs. And they should be uh, trained to, 
uh, record and report the things. So uh, the staff should be ha have a vital role by they can uh, regularly monitor the vital signs uh, and the, the recording must be very accurate and it's very important. And documentation of that recording is also important so that whenever you are call, called upon uh, and you, you can just go through those documentation and see the what's the train, how when the patient is deteriorating, what happened next so that you, you, you those who will go for the assessment, they will have clear idea. And the staff should uh, recognize the some of some of the danger signs they must have uh, the skill to interpret some of the abnormal values and not only those values uh, and they have to uh, correlate with the patient assessment patient clinical condition also and appropriate immediate uh, bedside any intervention that they can do and so, and they can relate those those things and they communicate and they can communicate with the seniors or the on duty doctors over there so it should be there so routine monitoring of vital signs is very important and in the what are the parameters that we are commonly monitoring in the, the, the critical care or even outside the critical care are uh, the parameters that uh, that are uh, consciousness level of consciousness temperature a pulse rate oxygen saturation blood pressure and respiratory rate. these are the things that we are commonly doing uh, in our, in our uh, uh, clinical setup and in level of consciousness the most important uh, uh, next slide please uh, uh, the level of consciousness that uh, ABPU is a good tool that uh, if uh, whether the patient is alert or not or he responds with the verbal uh, stimuli or respond to the uh, painful stimuli or patient is unresponsive. Um, by that you can know the neurological status of that patient uh, by the pulse rate or blood pressure you can uh, uh, look for the uh, cardiovascular system and oxygen saturation respiratory rate can uh, signal you the dysfunction with the respiratory system along with these basic parameters you can uh, if uh, you have a um, uh, facility to monitor intidal carbon dioxide that is also very helpful in the especially in the critical care area uh, another important parameter that we can monitor is that uh, the urine output yes that also helps us so by monitoring these basic parameters, we can uh, monitor the disease progression, whether patient is deteriorating or improving or that. Uh, and uh, we can make uh, some diagnosis, we can calculate some scoring system, and uh, we can uh, triage the patient, whether this patient needs uh, close monitoring, patient needs resuscitation, patient needs to be shifted uh, to the uh, high care center or even in the ICU. So triggering the escalation of care uh, is also based on these monitoring of this parameter. And, and uh, we can also monitor the response of the treatment that we have uh, given while during the assessment of those critically ill patients. We can research stage and we can monitor the response of the, well, how they are improving or not or deteriorating or the, these parameters are uh, getting worse. So uh, we can have broader idea uh, with this simple basic parameters. So in next slide, there is a monitor, yeah, thank you. Uh, here we can see that uh, the typical uh, monitor that we use to monitor the vital signs of the patients. Uh, if we see in this monitor, uh, the, the, there is a continuous ECG monitoring, there is heart rate monitoring, the oxygen saturation, respiratory rate, and uh, the non-invasive blood pressure. So at a glance, it looks uh, very uh, perfect, but if you go in the depth of uh, this monitor, then you, you can see that the blood pressure is in the lower side, though the mean arterial pressure is uh, 65. But uh, if you go in the detail section, of, I, I'm sorry that uh, it's not clear, but the, I can clearly see that uh, and the, in the train graph that uh, the previous uh, two recordings were 
the patient was very hypertensive that 150 uh, systolic and the diastolic more than 110 and suddenly patient patient blood pressure is 78 by 30 and so on and the current blood pressure is 80 a three uh, by 55 millimeter of mercury. So with the monitoring of the trend, uh, we know that, that this patient is certain something has happened that um, previously patient was uh, hypertensive uh, and patient suddenly came, uh, went into the hypertension. So um, this sort of patient and uh, this sort of monitoring uh, can help to identify some uh, deteriorating condition, some uh, ongoing uh, arrest can be prevented by monitoring this sort of uh, trend of the, more, the vital signs. So now coming to the, what are the things that, uh, tools that we use that to say that whether uh, this patient is uh, deteriorating or not, whether this patient is critically ill or not, what level of care should be given. So there, there are certain uh, severity of illness scoring system that uh, will signify that uh, the, uh, what type of care should be given. So early warning score systems are there and it, they are commonly practiced uh, uh, around the uh, various uh, critical care setups and they can help to recognize the early signs of clinical situation uh, in order to initiate early intervention and management. This, uh, this sort of early warning uh, tools are very simple. They are designed and there are uh, sort of parameters which are, that we routinely monitor that we discussed uh, recently. And they are graded according to the degree of derangement. So zero, one, two, and three. So according to that, uh, the marking will be given and the aggregate marking uh, will guide us the appropriate action to be taken uh, so it helps us. So there are different types of early warning scoring system in adults and in pediatric also there is pediatric early warning scores. In obstetric, there is a modified obstetric um, uh, early warning systems. Uh, likewise, in the traumatic injury, there are lots of early warning signs that uh, helps us to uh, know the patient who are at very high risk of clinical deterioration are, and are critically ill. So this sort of early warning scores, they are uh, standard ones uh, we can get uh, also, but uh, we can adapt and even modify those uh, early warning uh, system according to the, uh, our local concept that suits in our uh, locality, in our uh, setups, in our population. And this sort of early warning scores, uh, they can be used not only inside the uh, intensive care unit, but also in the emergency room, in the operating theaters, in, uh, in the high care units, or even in the uh, most uh, importantly, if we use in the general wards, it have a better outcome uh, also. So that uh, the, those patients who are at high risk of uh, deteriorating can be identified early and can be resuscitated early. So this is the one of the early warning score, uh, the national uh, early warning score news two uh, that is uh, commonly use uh, these days and in basically this is commonly used in, in all over the united kingdom and is endorsed by the royal college of physician and there are uh, the physio uh, some physiological parameters and there is scoring from zero to three and uh, uh, that uh, we, we previously we were talking about the respiratory rate uh, oxygen saturation with or without oxygen if patient is in air or oxygen, uh, systolic blood pressure, pulse, consciousness, and temperature, these common parameters uh, we can monitor and we, we can score them uh, with the news score. And we can see uh, with the aggregate score, if the aggregate score is uh, between one to two, then the, there is a very a low risk uh, for clinical risk for the patient and patient can be managed within the ward level. And, but uh, if uh, the red score is there, that means 
any of the, the seven parameters if any parameters is scoring three then that is a red score and that that is the medium clinical risk and uh, along with that the if the aggregate of uh, the score is between five to six then that is uh, there is chance of medium mix of clinical risk of detoxing uh, patient and uh, there must be some system to monitor this this sort of patient and uh, there must be a communicate close communication with the rapid response team uh, so that this patient may may be very uh, deteriorating within the next few minutes so uh, research station trigger uh, the research station team or the rapid response team should uh, the trigger should be in the aggregate score of five or six or the individual score of three and if the aggregate score is seven or more, then, then this patient is definitely very critically killed. This patient must be immediately responded by the rapid response team and the care must be escalated and patient must be uh, shifted to the uh, critical care area and taking care. So uh, these scores help us to identify at what uh, clinical risk of the patient is and what level of the care should be provided to the patient, at which area this patient should be treated and how frequently this patient should be monitored. So uh, at one point only the data won't uh, say uh, have the meaning. So uh, we have to repeatedly uh, assess the scoring system uh, within the frequent interval, depending upon the condition of the patient. And uh, if the score is improving, that's a good sign. If the score is deteriorating in the subsequent uh, uh, minutes or hour, then patient might be uh, the initially patient was at low risk, but uh, ultimately land up in, in the uh, at a higher risk and to be shifted to the critical, uh, critical uh, care area. So it's very important to calculate this uh, scoring system. This is just one of the example, but you can have uh, your own uh, uh, scoring system or you can adapt other uh, such scoring system that can suit in your uh, setup and you can even modify according to the, your context, like uh, the standard WHO patient surgical safety checklist that we can modify slightly in our setup also. Likewise, the scoring systems as theirs, and you can have one of those scoring systems that can uh, standardize the care, that can have uniformity of assessment, and it will objectively, uh, uh, objectively say that the patient is improving or deteriorating or what level of care is required. So severity scores are widely used uh, all over the world. And apart from that, and various other uh, organic-specific, disease-specific scoring systems are also there. One of the studies uh, has been shown there, the clinical review scoring system in critically ill, uh, where a different scoring system uh, uh, are discussed and uh, the uh, and uh, like uh, there are various other scoring system like Apache acute physiology uh, and chronic health evaluation score or in disease specific like you know, for the sepsis quick SOFA score or SOFA score uh, for the traumatic brain injury patients GCS scoring uh, and the, the uh, simplified uh, acute physiological score MPS score multiple uh, organ dysfunction score and the, uh, for pulmonary embolism Wells score like accordingly there are lots of various uh, disease specific or certain condition specific scoring systems are there and the more commonly used one is the Apache 2 score that we use uh, to score uh, during the patient admission in, in the ICUs. Uh, within the first 24 hours, we take uh, the parameters, which is the worst parameter, and we calculate and we, we, we get the prognosis of the patient, whether what is the probability uh, of morbidity and mortality of this patient. Uh, so we can predict that uh, for the patient who are in 
risks of sepsis or already has sepsis or septic shock uh, so quick so high score and so high score can help so likewise uh, various uh, such scoring system can be used uh, to predict the outcome uh, to, uh, to characterize the disease severity and what uh, what sort of degree of organ dysfunction is there uh, to quantify it will it, it helps us and the reporting part is also very important so and uh, some of uh, us are working in the ground, ground level in the icus uh, or some are uh, looking after as expert so uh, there must be a clear reporting system and communication between uh, the uh, the staffs and the caregivers and the clinicians about the patient's conditions so the care the clinicians should be informed about the patient condition and it's uh, there must be some system uh, so that uh, the staffs can uh, report immediately if the patient condition is unstable if the patient is deteriorating or if, if the ongoing uh, therapy is uh, not responding and uh, patient needs extra care so those sort of things should be uh, reported to to the uh, concerned physician or concerned clinician who is primarily looking uh, after th those sort of patients. So reporting is another important uh, thing in the uh, assessment and recognition of critically ill patients so that you can know that whether a patient is uh, improving or not improving or uh, even deteriorating. So here I end my part of the session uh, where we discuss about the critical illness, it's important, golden hour, and uh, the thing that we, we, so most of the thing that in the science, we, we fail to pick up those signs and patient land up with the crash uh, arrest or patient uh, rust into the ICUs. So there must be some uh, 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 system to objectively assess those patients like early warning scoring system is are there that we can adopt in our setups and uh, there are disease specific other systems and uh, common clear communication between the uh, staffs must be there and uh, very importantly a rapid response team a system of rapid, rapid response team in the hospital is very crucial to identify and timely resuscitate the uh, critically ill patient. So uh, here I hand over uh, next session uh, where we will discuss in detail about the comprehensive assessment of the critically ill patient. What is the difference between the assessment of the critically ill patient and the conventional assessment technique and how we should approach those patients uh, will be dealt in the subsequent session. And I think Dr. Paul Masapi is ready uh, <laughs> with his excellent presentation. Uh, Dr. Paul? Okay, uh, thank okay. you, Dr. Podo. Yeah. <laughs> it was uh, such a remarkable presentation and has done a lot of heavy lifting to my part. Hello, thank everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Paul Masapi. I'm a practicing anesthesiologist and uh, intensivist, and also adjunct lecturer at. Uh, Mwimbili National Hospital. I'm hailing from Dar es Salaam. I, I think everybody's having a wonderful time. And just to carry the torch uh, from what uh, Dr. Podo has presented, all of these things, they need to be done systematically or else they'll be forgotten some of the crucial and some of the um, life uh, threatening parts. So, uh, in order to do that, uh, I think uh, we're going to see on the next slide how we are, we are doing it. So the approach toward any critical ill patient should be uh, systematically following a systematic way of A, B, C, D, E. Um, and this approach is very uh, well known to most of us because it's the uh, most recommended approach towards uh, emergence uh, medicine and acute care setups. So this acronym is arranged very properly uh, in order of priority, A for airway, B for breathing, 
C for circulation, D uh, for disability, E for exposure, F for fluid, G for gastric, H hematology, intervention, and at the last of it, uh, judgment. And while you are doing that, uh, most of these parameters you'll, you'll get to collect, uh, they will really help you uh, into position uh, the patient in a certain score in uh, the four taught uh, early warning system. So uh, starting with airway uh, in the next slide, airway assessment is a priority to ensure that there, there is the ability to oxygenate and ventilate. We all know that uh, there is the importance of uh, oxygen uh, in the body as it's uh, a core, uh, uh, it's a core uh, culprit in a lot of metabolism. So uh, failure to oxygenate, it can lead you uh, patient to die pretty quick. So that's why it is set in the airway. Uh, what you have to do is to make sure you assess the uh, airway patency, especially if the patient is unconscious or having any uh, sign of air, airway obstruction, such as snoring or desaturating. Uh, to keep the airway patient patent, you can also uh, try the triple airway maneuver, such as jaw thrust, chin lift, and head tilt. And if there is a, any other foreign body, it could be removed or suction applied. Also, if uh, you also need to assess uh, the need of uh, definitive airway uh, control by using endotracheal tube and provision of invasive ventilation. And if by any chance you received uh, th these patients uh, already intubated, you have to make sure the endotracheal tube is patent and you have to make sure that the correct size was selected and the length out. Uh, the length out is really important, especially in checking if uh, the endotracheal tube is still in. Make sure you revisit the documented uh, fixture uh, length and uh, try to, to see if it still holds. Otherwise, you might see your patient with endotracheal tube, meanwhile the tube is out and it's not in the trachea. So uh, in summary, airway assessment is really important and it should be started in that chronological order of ABCDE. Going to breathing, it's uh, also really important in, the, uh, in that same assessment to make sure you try to check, especially for the patients that are definitely needing intubation. Patient who is uh, impending airway obstruction, such uh, as a uh, patient uh, of uh, that are victims of uh, burn injuries or patient with signs of unsustainable work of breathing. You may be passing the world as a member of a rapid response team and you get to see the patient is uh, breathing using a lot of force and a lot of incorporation of accessory muscles. You can, uh, by your clinical judgment, you can tell that work of breathing is not uh, sustainable and the patient at some point will go into respiratory failure. So that could be a sign that uh, could indicate uh, your patient might require um, an intubation and probably uh, invasive ventilation support. Refract refractory hypoxemia and hypercapnia are also known to be one of the common uh, indications uh, of uh, uh, intubation especially if uh, the patient was being tried to as a sort of uh, non-invasive ventilation mechanism and was not in, uh, doing well. Inadequate air protection could also be another indication, especially to those uh, patients that uh, have come with a, either rapid uh, deteriorating uh, Glasgow uh, coma uh, scale, uh, or the patient that has a lower GCS score of uh, less than eight. That's a very common practice of uh, giving them uh, endotracheal intubation so as we can definitively uh, protect the airway. Moving to breathing B, it's important to take note to the respiratory rate of the patient uh, in both high ends 
it could be tachypnea, it could be bradypnea, and uh, the desaturation, all of these uh, might warrant uh, an intervention uh, so as uh, we can rescue the patient. Make sure that you, you, you do a physical examination by inspecting uh, the, the, the patient uh, respiratory system. Make sure you note uh, the use of uh, accessory muscles because whenever we see accessory muscles uh, are incorporated in a normal uh, breathing cycle, it could uh, insinuate that uh, the work of breathing is really high. Make sure you check for any other abnormalities. Palpation and percussion are of paramount importance especially in detecting other uh, complications uh, that are commonly occurring in uh, critical ill patients, such as pneumothorax or pleural effusion. You can also uh, ascultate the chest to make sure that uh, you ascertain the airway entry and also detecting if there is any anomaly uh, inside uh, the lungs. And if uh, your patient is in a ventilator, uh, especially advanced ventilator such as ours, make sure that the patient uh, parameter are appropriate uh, to the respiratory condition and needs the patient that is having. Make sure you select the right mode, the right uh, amount of oxygen and parameters such as uh, tidal volume and pressures uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the amount of air that they are getting from the machine uh, is right. The machine on its own cannot decide uh, what's right uh, for your patient. You have uh, to revisit the appropriate ways and uh, use your clinical judgment to ascertain the amount of, uh, of air in terms of volume and pressure that's going to your patient. If you're in a high-end uh, uh, hospital, ABG and chest x-ray is also really important to ascertain the uh, uh, the, uh, the amount of uh, gases that are already being delivered to the blood of your patient. Uh, so after B, we go, go to C, which is circulation. Circulation is really important. You have to make sure uh, that your patient has a, a sustained uh, MAP because uh, even if you're oxygenating the lungs, you have to make sure that you have uh, a fluid, which is blood, to carry the uh, oxygen towards a different part of the body, especially the vital organs. Uh, and by checking the circulation, we commonly do uh, the capillary refill test. We have to make sure that uh, the patient has a, a, a adequate capillary refill. We can also check the heart rate, which will be recorded uh, by your monitor. Invasive and non-invasive blood pressure, if they can be obtained, uh, they will really help you to make a lot of uh, uh, clinical judgment, as we have seen. Uh, also, you are supposed to check uh, the periphery, check them for supply, check them for warmth. That could be a good indicator that uh, even the extremities of your body are perfused correctly. Uh, after that, you can conduct the rest of the CVS, detailed CVS exam and document your findings. It's really important to document because whenever uh, you leave the patient, somebody can come and, uh, and take care uh, after you have left. They need to see that progress or deterioration to, to, to make sure they trigger a right uh, clinical intervention, whether to reduce some of the interventions that you instigated earlier or to escalate care by uh, calling uh, seniors or uh, help from other team members or activate uh, uh, the calling of a rapid response team in your uh, local setting. Make sure you check and interpret ECG uh, tracing if available, because that also uh, could uh, really give you uh, an impending uh, signals to uh, lethal uh, complications such as the electrolyte imbalance and the whole welfare of the uh, cardiac uh, status. And if the vasopressor or ionotropes are used, make sure uh, you document the right dosage and probably the response that you have been having with them so as the next succeeding team could know what uh, to do. Uh, for vascular cassette, example, central line, arterial line, and the 
uh, renal vascular catheter, there should be noted site and duration. We have to remember that uh, these gadgets, they need to be uh, uh, changed in time and because they also carry an inherent uh, risk of uh, infection. So they should, you should ascertain their patterns and their uh, duration that they've been placed in your patient so as to avoid the other complications that comes as part and parcel of having these devices uh, in situ of, of your patient. So for disability, D, uh, what we have here, we normally perform a neurological assessment, as it has been hinted by the former uh, presenter. Uh, here is where you have to take your AVPU scale. This is a very uh, known scale, especially in a pediatric population. You have to, to check uh, the response of your patient, whether they, they are spontaneously alert or respond to verbal pain, or they are totally unconsciousness. Uh, this gives you a, a, a quick overview of neurological status of the patient. But uh, GCS uh, could also be done, Glasgow Coma Scale, uh, assessing verbal eye and motor response of your patient. Uh, could also hint uh, the severity of, of uh, the complication that they are having. Pupillary assessment is really important uh, by checking the size uh, and uh, reaction to light. Uh, this can uh, give you some hint of uh, other neurological complications such as uh, brain hematoma could also give the, uh, you the progress uh, of the patient uh, to, and they are good indicators of uh, things like uh, brain death. Uh, muscle tone and power uh, and reflexology as a part of uh, for a thorough neurological assessment should be assessed. And if the patient has been sedated, as, uh, this assessment uh, should be done, especially in the uh, sedation holidays, so as to make sure you get uh, the right uh, and optimal value. Uh, that the patient is currently experiencing. Uh, because in the acute care setting, sometimes you might have a patient that is uh, continuously on, sedat on sedation. So if you are doing this assessment, you might have a, a, a false uh, lower scores. Meanwhile, the patient is uh, doing well. It's just the sedation that is uh, depressing them. Uh, but all in all, remember also the critically ill patient can feel pain and pain is regarded as a fifth uh, vital sign. Uh, and by treating pain, you only uh, better the outcome of the patient and you also stabilize even the other uh, vitals that we have, we, we have talked about. Uh, going to FE uh, exposure, after you've done ABCD is really important. Uh, here is when you can do your general examination, check the whole uh, general uh, bodily appearance or bodily habitus. Uh, if the patient is pale, jaundiced or edema or any, anything else of important to note, it's important to, to be assessed and uh, recorded and been monitored so as to know uh, if there's anything else or if there's any other complications that's arising either from the treatment or the progression of the disease. Going to F, we check here for fluids. Normally uh, the patients in acute care, it's really important to take note of both uh, output and input of, of the fluid. Uh, to make sure we are ensuring a normal hydration status uh, all the time. Normal hydration uh, status uh, during critical care is of paramount importance because hydration uh, status could affect uh, your whole body pH and electrolyte uh, balances. So it's important to note that uh, the intake and output of, of the patient is appropriate. And we normally aim uh, at more than uh, 30 mils of, uh, per hour of urine output because this corresponds to a normal uh, physiological body weight. But if you are doing with a pediatric uh, patient, consider having a urine of one to two mils uh, per kg per hour as an appropriate uh, urine 
output uh, that you are aiming for. Uh, going to G, G for gastric, make sure you also uh, check feeding status, uh, especially nasogastric feed or free feed or uh, total parental nutrition. If you have, uh, although uh, recent guideline uh, advocating for early uh, entero uh, feedings, make sure you check uh, blood glucose level uh, every time and uh, for special emphasis to people with metabolic uh, disorders such as diabetes mellitus, make sure you examine the abdomen uh, and get a thorough record of bowel habits uh, because people, especially in a critical care and the ICUs uh, can, can have uh, tendencies of having partial or total intestinal obstruction. So uh, you should make a thorough follow-up on the bowel habits in that G section of gastric. In hematology, uh, make sure that uh, you review all the lab results uh, and, and act appropriately. And in, in, the, in the intervention section, make sure you uh, review all the intervention and procedure done, drug dosages and duration. Uh, make sure you scale up or you add the drugs that are needed or they've, uh, they, they've been warranted because of the assessment that you have done in the prior systems or remove the drugs that they've outlived their purpose. Make sure the drugs are given and make sure they are given in correct dose and duration. So uh, that's in summary is the systematic way of assessing the patient in a critically ill setup. Uh, it's important to know uh, that uh, you follow the, uh, the mnemonic A, B, C, D, E. So as you don't forget any of uh, the parameters in between. And also, this also is a fight the work of being handed over to your fellow colleagues uh, to make sure that you're maintaining that uh, continuum of care and also for uh, reporting and documentation purposes. Uh, so after all that assessment, uh, you, you have to make sure you have an impression or uh, it's a judgment of the whole assessment, and you 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 are supposed to list the problems found in the whole assessment by the list of uh, of the priority, and you may include your diagnoses and maybe complications that were noted to be arising either from the disease progression or from the complication of the treatment, and also perhaps uh, some new conditions independent of the diagnosis and also impending complication that uh, you postulate that they may arise uh, in, in the array of, of care that you are given. And plan treatment according to the problem identify and giving the priority to the most life-threatening problem that they should lead uh, you, 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 your whole thought process in terms of intervention. So you might ask yourself, why are we doing all of this? Uh, do we have to really follow that chronological arrangement uh, in, in the assessment in critical care patient? What, what value does it hold? So it, we are doing that so that we have the following benefit. By following that uh, chronological uh, order, will be readily able to recognize diseases and diseases severity and not the progress of, of, of the disease. And by doing those assessment also, they will help us in determining determination of early warning scores because most of the parameters that are utilized in early warning scores are obtained uh, in, the, in the, that systematic assessment of uh, A, B, C, D, E. It will also uh, help us in triage of our patients and also give us an, an insight toward monitoring uh, the response of the treatment that we are giving to our patient. And if the, our patients are not responding well, uh, 
following that assessment could uh, give you credibility to escalate uh, the degree of care that you you are giving your patient maybe it might warrant you calling your seniors or as a, a super specialized uh, type of cares that are available in your uh, vicinity and also it will alert you uh, if you cannot probably provide optimal care uh, it will give you a, an appropriate hint uh, that is the time you refer these patients to, to possibly higher end uh, institutions if uh, the situation allow and you have availability of, of such options. Effective utilization of resource could also uh, be a benefit that you can be given by this uh, assessment, as you will see uh, what resources are needed and what should be allocated to, uh, to your uh, critical care setup, since you have noted what are the uh, common problems that do occur in the, such a setup. And assessment will also give you uh, a window to, uh, to detect uh, different uh, complication is arising from the disease progression or the care that you are giving promptly and early so as uh, to quote them while they are still uh, uh, not quite an issue and to deal with them and sometimes even uh, prevent uh, them to escalate into a life uh, threatening levels so thorough routine assessment should be conducted in all clinical setting and not only during uh, critical care. Yes, the assessment is of paramount uh, importance in the critical care, but this assessment could be uh, carried out anywhere in each setup from the general wards uh, to ER to o OTs and uh, hence ICUs. Yeah. Uh, so, after all uh, the presented uh, concepts, uh, we have managed to come with uh, the following recommendations. So developing and using of early warning systems uh, tools in ER, triage and wards will help to recognize early signs of severe uh, disease and, and maximize benefit from critical uh, care. As you can see, this is uh, it's not just a, a, a hearsay, uh, it has been substantiated with uh, a study such as the one you can see on your right, uh, that uh, this study was conducted in Saudi Arabia and it noted that uh, just by having uh, as early warning systems and scores and rapid response teams, uh, they managed to cut the rate of uh, mortality and morbidity by more than 75. Uh, and uh, cardiac arrests were, 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 were reduced to less than 80%. So all the patients that are admitted should have an early warning score to guide the management plan. And you can adapt the systematic ABC assessment approach for unstable patient assessment and intervention occur at the same time. So you don't just access from A to J, from airway to your judgment, and then come uh, to intervene. Whenever you assess and you find there is a, an anomaly, you are supposed to intervene right away. And make sure you improve capacity for routine monitoring of patient vital signs, because uh, this, uh, could be easily obtained and easily interpreted and they are normally quick to hint whenever something is going wrong. And as we have said, establishment of uh, rapid response teams in your setting, if it could be done, will really help uh, the acute care uh, that we are giving to, to our patient. So in conclusion, a recognition of critical illness is a key in improving outcomes. That's uh, one of the powerful points that we should take with us to our home and our practices. Good outcome rely on rapid identification, diagnosis, and definitive treatment or intervention. All clinicians should 
possess the skill to recognize the critical ill patient and instigate appropriate initial management. Different method can be utilized for recognizing early critical illness, such as early warning scores, routine monitoring and routine assessment. Assessment of critical ill should follow a comprehensive and systematic structure of ABC approach. Uh, this approach facilitates uh, uh, correction of life-threatening problems by priority and provide a standardized approach between clinicians. So as it acts as a common language and a common uh, framework of care to, to our patient in our day-to-day -day, uh, provision of care. Thank you. So maybe uh, I should hand it back to our moderator, Dr. Spuka, uh, to tell us uh, the following proceedings. Yeah, as you can see, these are our references. And the articles have been shared on the chat section as uh, they were presented. Uh, so, all right. No, thank, thank you. Karibu Ndaba. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Po and uh, Dr. Puspa, for the very wonderful uh, presentations. Um, there's actually a lot of appreciation from the chat box that the presentations are very, are very uh, educative and elaborative. So at this point, I would like to invite any questions or comments or contributions or clarification from our, from our participants. You can kindly raise your hand um, uh, or just immediately unmute and please go ahead and make a contribution. Uh, so any, any, any questions or any contributions um, from our participants. Yeah, whilst I think we are waiting for uh, comments, uh, we have, I think, two questions that came through our question and answer uh, chat box. The first question was asked by Samuel. Uh, Samuel says, um, hello, thank you for the presentation so far. Are there no interventions at sea or circulation step? How exactly uh, is that intervention different from the F, uh, which is fluids step? So are there, are, there, are there no interventions that can be done at, at C step or at circulation when you're assessing the circulation? Are there any interventions that can be done um, at that point? Those interventions, are they different from the ones that can be instituted uh, at the F stage or the fluid uh, stage? Um, uh, Dr. Paul, do you want to take a go? Yes, sure thing, Daba. Thank you, Samuel Ayogu, uh, for such a wonderful question. And uh, you have been, it shows us you have been keen uh, during the presentation. So, um, in, in circulation, we have to remember uh, that uh, there are a lot of things uh, that are affecting uh, circulation. Uh, it's not necessarily the, the fluid, uh, which is the blood. It could also be the vessels. It could also be the pump, which is the heart. So whenever you're designing an, uh, an intervention in C, uh, you, can, you, can, you can have the fluid. Yes, fluid could also so uh, being intertwined in the, as an approach uh, of an intervention in C, but you can have your vasopressors. Uh, you, you can also uh, check the heart, uh, how it's responding. Uh, so may, may, maybe the heart is having pericardial effusion, things like uh, pericardial synthesis uh, could, 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 uh, could count as a C intervention. Maybe uh, the problem that you, 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 you are dealing with uh, doesn't respond to fluid alone. Uh, maybe it will be a time to uh, consider vasopressors. 
So uh, I think it's a wonderful question, but uh, there are quite more interventions that could be uh, done at sea, including uh, giving uh, blood products such as uh, wood blood, uh, heart disease and the like. They could also be done at sea. I, I think maybe uh, I should welcome another panelist uh, if they have any other input on that. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Po. I think precisely your, your response. Really, there are so many outcomes um, on uh, circulation. And like you clearly mentioned, circulation also includes cardiac uh, assessment. So your interventions or your actions really would depend on what findings, specific findings. It can be hypertension, it can be hypotension, it can be uh, fluid depletion. It can be maybe a patient who needs vasopressors, uh, fluid replacement, uh, and other forms of cardiovascular support, uh, which differs from F because F, you are now talking about specifically fluid kind of interventions. We are giving your ring as lactate or normal saline, you are transfusing the patient versus how much the patient is able to, to produce as, as your urine output. Yeah, so they are, they, they, what, you, what, what, what you do for the patient really depends on what your specific findings on your um, a circulation assessment. Then I would quickly read, I can't see any hands so far, but I would read the next question. And uh, this one, I'll give it to Dr. Puspa. Uh, this one is from Alan. Um, partly I responded, but I, I just want to find out if there are any additional comments from Dr. Puspa. So Alan uh, says in a, in a resource limited setting, as for example, ABG machines um, is not functional. How can we assess and score a critically ill patient? Uh, the Apache 2 or SOFA score scoring systems won't be possible if the ABG parameters are unavailable. So how can we score, um, how can we assess and score critically ill patients? in the absence of parameters such as those that can be obtained from the arterial blood gas analysis. Uh, Dr. Puspa, do you want to take a go? Yes, Dr. Uh, Yandaba. Uh, thank you for the questions, Dr. Elan. Uh, Dr. Yandaba has nicely addressed that issue because um, uh, all the scoring systems are not designed for the resource limited settings and some of them have limitations and uh, the ABC is the major limitations in the commonly used uh, uh, scoring system like Apache 2 and the SOVA score. So uh, we cannot calculate uh, without the pH value and the other uh, ABG parameters uh, for the full score. Uh, in Apache 2, they have mentioned that if you don't have the bicarbonate uh, in your machine, then uh, you can do like this. And they have given alternative, but there is uh, no evidence of alternative for the whole ABG parameters in uh, in that uh, scoring system. So, uh, likewise, uh, that uh, Dr. Andaba has uh, mentioned that. Uh, similarly, we, certainly it has limitations. So we have to look for the, another uh, alternative scoring system that matches uh, to the parameters that we are uh, in our set of what are parameters we are looking after and we can enter. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pospa. Uh, for that particular response. I can see there's a hand from uh, Oluwa Sean. Uh, Oluwa Sean, you can, you, can, you can unmute your mic and go ahead and make a comment. Oluwa Sean, I have yes, permitted so you to speak. Yeah, so Oluwa Sean, just unmute your microphone and and go ahead and speak uh your microphone still remains muted
Okay, there's a, there's a hand from Dr. Puspa. You want to, to make a contribution? As we um, yes. wait for all were shown. Yes. Okay, so all were shown when you are when you are able to just kindly unmute and then go ahead and uh, uh, make a contribution. So I'll read as as I wait for more hands. Um, I'll read more uh, comments from the chat box. Uh, we have Richard uh, Kahalu from. Uh, Lusaka Zambia, he says the early warning systems are an important tool to use, and he feels that they should be used much more routinely, um, which, is, uh, which is very true. So early warning systems have been shown and proved to be quite effective, and um, they've led to good outcomes in settings where they've been used routinely and, and consistently. They are simple tools that we can actually uh, adapt to our facilities and use them, especially in the ER, in the emergency room or areas where you manage emergency conditions and also in the uh, general wards. Yeah, are there any other contributions or anything else to share with the participants as we conclude? Anything from our panelists okay dr ndaba maybe i uh, should just uh, add um, uh, a little bit from the former questioner uh, i think it was mm -hmm. uh, alan uh, he hinted that uh, it's really challenging having a fancy gadget uh, such as uh, abg machines in our day-to-day -day setups so maybe maybe a quick advice on that is this uh, early warning uh, scores, you, you don't have to select uh, maybe Apache. You can select anything uh, that is really reflective of your uh, environment. Like the score that was uh, presented by Dr. Uh, Podo, uh, the National Early Warning Score, News, News 2. Most of the parameter there, they could be easily obtained, such as respiratory rate, SpO2, temperature, systolic blood pressure, pulse rate and consciousness, and temperature. All of these parameters are commonly recorded in our day-to-day -day care. Uh, but also, uh, some of these scores, uh, since they are developed by scientific experiment, uh, a little bit of uh, local contact could be added, as uh, you, you uh, like the one uh, a Kigali modification of uh, Berlin definition of ARDS. We see they opt out uh, the ABG and they instituted a new ratio with SPO2 and the FIO2. So it's also allowed to put uh, a local content on a certain score that you think you relate with, but you are lacking uh, some of the uh, of the additional guides uh, such as a ABG machine. I think that could be applied. Yeah, thank thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul, for that additional explanation. So as we conclude, uh, just allow me to take two more questions from our chat box. Um, the first one is from Messi Origa. Messi Origa says a great presentation. Um, uh, thank you to the presenters. So the question is, after you have intervened and intubated the patient with impending respiratory failure, do you then have to sedate the patient uh, as you mechanically ventilate the patient so that the endotracheal tube can be tolerated by a patient who is conscious. So after intubation, the question is, do you have to sedate the patient so that they can tolerate the tube? So I'll, I'll, I'll give this one to Dr. Paul, uh, simply because you discussed um, um, uh, the ABC kind of assessment. Uh, thank you, Ndaba. Uh, and again, thank you, uh, Ms. Origa, for such a wonderful question.
Uh, I think if I, I read you correctly, you said uh, this concerned patient uh, is already having uh, impending respiratory failure uh, and you already invaded. First of all, the whole process uh, of intubation, if there is uh, no contraindications, the whole process will involve uh, a degree of uh, hypnosis or sedation and paralysis. So most of these patients immediately after, uh, immediately after, uh, after, uh, after intubation, they'll be already sedated and somewhat uh, and somewhat paralyzed. So I think uh, we, maybe we leave up to you, Messi, according to your clinical judgment after the assessment, if the patient was really, really in uh, uh, an impending respiratory failure, I think it, it should be appropriate to give them an adequate sedation for some time and an adequate paralysis for some time to allow them to uh, recuperate from uh, uh, that high-end work of breathing that they were performing that led you to decide that they might uh, need that intubation in the first place. So I think it's, it's wise, but uh, this is guided uh, with uh, clinical judgment uh, to paralyze and maybe sedate them for a nearby time before uh, continue with uh, other assessment and try to, to reevaluate to see if they are progressing for the better. But uh, it should not be confused, uh, sedation and analgesia, which is one of the common misconceptions. Make sure also your patient, uh, um, uh, uh, their pain is controlled well, as we, we have discussed in disability pain being the fifth vital sign. So, yeah, at the initial uh, phase, it will be wise to consider sedation, paralysis, and uh, possibly analgesia. Uh, that's my take on it. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Uh, I, th I think, I think um, that answers precisely answers the question. It really depends on your assessment, the reason for intubation, and then um, your need for sedation as well as pain, admin, pain management. Then the last question, um, this one, I'll, I'll, I'll allow Dr. Powder to respond. This one is from Godwin Eda. Godwin Eda says, which is better to use uh, between AVPU or the GCS when you're assessing for disability? AVPU or GCS? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Yandaba. And thank you, Godwin, for the questions. And definitely for the assessment of uh, disability, uh, there are certain uh, systems that we, we monitor and we calculate. So one of them is ABPU and another one, the common one is the GCS. So uh, when you, uh, it depends upon the situation when you are in what setup you are uh, assessing the patient. So if you are assessing the critically ill patient in, outside the uh, ICU and uh, in the very critically ill patient at the bedside, then at that time, you don't, you don't have time to go with the uh, lengthy parameters of the uh, GCS, then you can quickly see the uh, AVPU. And if you have time, then uh, GCS is definitely is the gold standard for disability assessment and objective assessment. So for the bedside one, I, I prefer for AVPU and for the detailed objective assessment, GCS is the better one. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pardo. Um, indeed, I think at this point, um, we are coming to the close of this uh, session, this wonderful session. Um, I'm going to ask Magdalena, uh, who is the training manager at Gradient Health Systems, to give us the closing, closing remarks. Otherwise, thank you, everyone, for uh, participating and also thank you so much to the presenters and the panelists for the wonderful discussion. 
Uh, Magdalena, um, over to you, madam. Hello all, uh, thank you very much for attending the, the session. We are very pleased um, that the attendance was at a hundred plus and you all kept, um, kept in, uh, stayed in. Uh, ours is to just um, let you know that we are an organization that deals with technology on uh, anesthesia and critical care. Um, so um, doing this is uh, um, came, came about because of COVID and the aspects of um, critical, uh, critical care need during that time and what it has done to most of our hospitals wherever we are in, 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 our, in our countries. So I know that some of you have used our machines and have interacted with some of the trainers that we have uh, from all over um, in Rwanda, Tanzania, Kenya, Zambia, Burundi, DRC, um, Niger recently, um, the French market and all. Um, I know you, you know our machines. In case of any queries about uh, use of our machines or, uh, or in case you need any clarification, please feel free to reach us out and give us your feedback at customers at gradienthealth.org. Also, please give us feedback on, um, uh, on, on, on the trainings that you on, on these webinars and what you would like to see in your hospitals, especially because most of us are working in low resource, uh, low resource um, areas. So we are thankful and um, yeah, that is it. And looking forward to another webinar as, as we have our, um, our wonderful trainers from all over Nepal, Zambia and Tanzania uh, help us to, to share knowledge uh, worldwide. I, um, yeah, within the continent actually, and actually worldwide, yeah, because Dr. Puspa is from Nepal. So thank you all. Oh, thank you, thank you so much, um, uh, Magdalena, for 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 giving us a closing remarks. I think at this point, um, we'll call uh, this session. We'll bring this session to a close, and we look forward to the next month's webinar. And kindly watch out uh, for the topic so that you can also have an opportunity to read to read in advance, so that we can have a fruitful a fruitful discussion. And from all of us, um, wish you a wonderful evening, a wonderful morning, and a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.